What we are responsible for in this area that we cover is to identify um, potential organ donors, to approach the family about donation, check to see if that person is a registered donor, procure organs for transplant, and also tissues for transplant. So, some of these slides, um, if they're very self-explanatory, I may just skip over them and you guys can read it later at your own pace. But we're going to kind of just talk about the whole process from the time that, like, I get a phone call from a hospital referring a patient to the time that the organs are transplanted, okay? Okay, these are just kind of a run through of the PowerPoint. Okay, so I think you guys have already had your neuro lectures. You have already gone over herniation, correct? Okay. So you know there's several kinds, and basically when the brain tissue is moved from its original place, it's kind of pushed up against something, that's herniation. There's multiple kinds. Brain herniation can lead to brain death, and typically your organ donor is going to be a brain dead person. Um, there's multiple causes. The ones that we see the most, most in my field are going to be hemorrhages, usually due to trauma. We have a lot of car accidents. Being at the regional medical center is right here in our area. A lot of gunshot wounds, so we see a lot of those. Um, CVAs is the other thing, and anoxic injury also. So anytime you've got someone that has had any type of cardiac arrest with prolonged downtime, that's going to cause anoxic injury that can lead to cerebral edema, that can lead to herniation, at least to brain death. Um, this is just a diagram of the different types. Um, named by the direction that the brain tissue is made in. Okay, so I think what's important to know here is this Uniform Determination of Death Act. Um, this basically is, is when the government decided, like, this is how we're going to identify death in this country. Um, any individual who is sustained either irreversible, irreversible cessation of circulatory and respiratory function, so that's your patient that has a heart attack and has no pulse or not breathing. That's that's the obvious death that we're used to seeing. The second, though, that they added in in 1980 was irreversible cessation of all functions of the entire brain, including the brain stem. So that's your brain dead patient. If they're on the vent, like if they've been admitted to the hospital and they were emergently intubated, and they're on the ventilator, they're still going to be breathing, not on their own, but just because the ventilator's doing it for them. They're also still going to have a pulse, only because the ventilator's giving their body oxygen. But their brain is dead, and its brain tissue is not regenerate. You cannot fix brain death in any kind of way. So the second that you pull that patient off the ventilator and they quit getting oxygen to their brain because they're not going to breathe on their own, they're going to cardiac arrest. Okay. Lots of questions about that. So the, on, on the first one, number one, the time of death for this is going to be the time that you know the doctor comes around and, and listens to your heart. You don't have a pulse, you know, um, no heartbeat. That the time that they write, that's the time they pronounce you dead. With this brain death, your time of death is going to be the, the time that they pronounce that you're brain dead. So um, the American Academy of Neurology um, kind of set up just a standardized way that you test for this because um, obviously you don't want to make any mistakes. And this is something that a physician has to do. So this is not something that my organization is responsible for at all. And it's, it's something entirely done by the hospitals. And then when we come in, if, if they've declared the patient brain dead, then we'll move forward with our process. So the patient has to have some kind of coma with a known cause, meaning like, you know, usually you're going to have a CAT scan that shows edema or a stroke or some type of herniation, or you're going to know that they had a cardiac arrest and had 30 minutes of CPR and were down for 30 minutes before that, you're going to have a reason that explains why they are the way that they are. Their body temperature needs to be normal. They need to have a normal blood pressure. And there needs to be at least one neurological exam that shows that it's consistent with brain death. And we'll go over that in the next slide. So this is the clinical exam. Um, you're going to check for all of these reflexes. They all have to be absent, and they all have to be absent under the um, previous slides prerequisites. So you have to have a normal temperature, have to have a good blood pressure, 
and you can't, your pupils can't be reactive to light, no corneal reflex, no pain reflex, no um, cough or gag reflex, no ocular vestibular reflex. Do you guys know how that's done? The cup court test. You shoot 60 cc's of ice water into the ear and you look for the eyes that deviate towards, towards the ear. Right? If they don't do anything, that's consistent with brain death. The next one is ocular vestibular, I'm sorry, oculocephalic reflex, that's dog eyes. And that is when you rapidly move the head back and forth, back and forth. And if you and I do it, if our eye goes, or if our head goes to the right, our eye's gonna kind of center back to the middle. On these patients, their eyes roll with their head. They don't move, okay? <clears throat> And then the last one is spontaneous respirations. They should not have any. So if you take them off the vent just for a second, which is called an apnea exam, they're not going to breathe on their own. And the way a formal apnea exam is done is that they're actually taken off the vent for 10 full minutes and watched. Um, they still receive oxygen because you put a nasal cannula down their ET tube. You do an ABG, draw an ABG, and you want to look at, make sure it's all normal, basically. You want it as normal as possible. Take them off the vent completely for 10 full minutes. You time it. They're still getting oxygen the whole time, okay, 100%. But they're not getting the tidal volume. and They're not getting that breath delivered to them. It's passive oxygenation. After 10 minutes, you draw a second ABG, and then you put them back in the ventilator. What you're looking for is your PCA2, the before and the after. So you know normal is going to be 35 to 45. So for an apnea test to be consistent with brain death, you want to see that number rise above 60. So the PCA2 needs to be greater than 60, or it can also just be 20 greater than it was before. So either one of those two will, will be an apnea test that's consistent with brain death. Do you guys have questions about apnea exam? Okay. Is it just not uh, PACO mm -hmm. that you're looking at with the ABGs just for the apnea test? It's the PCO2. Just that test. Okay. Mm -hmm. it, you want the first one, everything normal though. I mean, you want it as normal as possible. The, the pH needs to be normal. The CO2 needs to be normal. The O2 can be high, but it doesn't need to be, they don't need to be hypo-oxygenated. Because you're not trying to hypo-oxygenate them. What you're trying to do is drive their CO2 up so that their, you know, their brain will tell them to take a breath. And when they don't, their brain doesn't tell them that, then that leads you to believe that you know, their brain does, along with these other findings. So the important thing to just remember is that all of these things have to be present. Like the apnea exam could be consistent with brain death, but if they've got pupillary re reaction to light, they're not, it's not brain death. So a lot of facilities will also, on top of these exams, do confirmatory testing. These confirmatory tests are not mandatory, okay? They're not legally, and most hospital policies don't require them either. They're kind of at the physician's discretion if they think that they need them. So, like, for instance, say you can't do a formal apnea test. Say when you take them off the vent, they immediately, their stats drop to 60, and they brady down. You're going to put them back on the vent, and that test is going to be aborted. So at that point, they might want to go and do an EEG just for something else to kind of help them feel more confident in their diagnosis. So the ones we do the most around here are cerebral brain flow. So you, this is done in nuclear medicine. Basically, they inject a um, radioisotope into the patient, and then the, the head is basically scanned, and they're looking to see, they're looking for uptake, reuptake of that isotope in the brain. In the brain-dead patient, what happens is it stops right here. So on scan, instead of seeing, it's almost like an angiogram in a way. Um, instead of seeing the isotope go up into the cerebral vasculature, it just gets cut off, and there's nothing. So that's also diagnostic of brain death. You can do an EEG, which they're going to, you know, typically, you guys are familiar with EEGs, I'm sure. Typically, you're kind of looking at it um, to determine like seizure activity. They put all the probes on your head. So this one, they're not concerned about seizures. They're looking to see, is there any activity at all? And if there is, whether it be normal or a seizure, that person's not brain dead. So on an EEG, if they are, it's going to be an isoelectric line just across it. There's nothing. Um, like I mentioned earlier, you can do an angiogram, kind of does the same thing as the flow. And um, transcranial Doppler, this one's not used a lot. Um, it's basically just a Doppler machine, and it's checking for a pulse rate. But there, there won't be one in a brain dead patient. Okay, 
So once a patient's declared brain dead, um, the hospital, and hopefully a little before they get to that point, the hospital will notify us. And it's the nurses, man. It will call us and be like, hey, this patient's meeting. You know, we've got certain clinical triggers that we ask staff to call us about. And when you guys get out and get your jobs and go through orientation, you'll see someone from our office again, and they'll go over that process with you. But the hospital alerts us. We come on site, and we start supporting the family. Once the brain death declaration is made and the family understands it, they understand that it's legal death, that their loved one cannot be recovered at that point, we'll go ahead and um, help them make end-of-life decisions. And one of those is to donate or to not donate. Other things we help them with, are, you know, if they need help arranging a funeral home or understand how the coroner process works, how to withdraw care, all of those things. We go over all of those things with them. And what can be donated? The, on the left is just a list of the organs. On the right are tissues. These are just some of the uses of these tissues. I'll let you guys just read over this on your own, okay? Um, if we, contain, if we obtain consent from the family for donation, we begin to evaluate the donor to ensure that, um, you know, there's going to be post-transplant uh, success for the recipient. So we're going to get a medical uh, social history of the donor, make sure there's no high-risk behavior that might, would, you know, bring into question, like, are they more likely to have HIV or have C, that kind of thing. We're going to send off serology testing, which is going to test them for HIV, hepatitis B, hepatitis C, a couple other things. Um, we do what's called NAT testing, it's nucleic acid testing, and we can actually pin it down to just about 48 hours on HIV contraction. Um, we're going to tissue type them, we're going to blood type them. The patient, once consent obtained and brain death has been declared, the patient's going to stay in the ICU. So it's the same room they were in, we don't move them. But someone like myself comes on site, um, we have a um, office of, there's six of us, order recovery coordinators. So me or one of my coworkers will come on site to the ICU and we'll do the, all the medical management of that patient from that point until the point of the order procurement. These patients are really, really unstable. Their brain's not working. It's not maintaining homeostasis for them anymore. So we have to do that through, through pharmacotherapy. Organ-specific testing is conducted. So, I mean, we're going to do labs. We're going to do an echo. We're going to get chest x-rays. We're going to do a bronch. All of those things to decide which organs are transplantable and which organs are not. Um, so we're always just trying to keep the patient stable and to normalize organ function. Who's paying for these labs? Once the family signs, that's a good question. I mean, once the family signs consent for authorization for donation, we cover all of those costs. We don't pay for anything before because that was part of that patient's treatment, and we don't pay for any of the brain death testing. And it's real important that those are not related because we are not there to try to buy organs. We're not there to try to coerce people and then making a decision they, they don't want to make. But we don't want to have families have to pay for a gift that they're giving to save other people's lives. So allocation. Once we decide like what's going to be transplantable, what's not, we've gotten our serology testing back and deemed that that patient doesn't have any type of infectious disease, we're going to create lists. I'm sure you're all part of these. Um, and it's basically a recipient list. And it's going to be kind of categorized by who's the sickest, who's been on the list the longest, who's likely to have the best outcomes. And it just goes in a row, one, two, three, four, five. And depending on what organ it is, this might be 300 people long. It might be 9,000 people long. Okay, it just depends. Um, transplant centers, like, so the first person on the list is federally regulated. So there's, yeah. Can I, like, for example, it is my friend, she come and donate her stuff. But I know my another family, can I say I specific on my organ to mm -hmm, the You people? can, and that's a good question, too. But you can. If you want to donate a kidney to your aunt that needs a kidney or to just a friend of yours or to somebody that works with your mom, you can. Um, and your family can do that too. If you're the family that's signing consent for you to be an organ donor wants to, they can too. What you can't do is you cannot donate based on specifics such as like age, sex, race. You can't do that. If you can't say, no, you can on geographic region, which is weird. So you can say, like, I only want my ten my kidney to go to somebody from Tennessee. You can do that. But you can't say, I want my kidney to go to 
you know, this Caucasian, only Caucasian women that live in Tennessee under 25. You can't do that. So once you send out the offer, transplant centers have one hour to make a decision whether they're accepting that organ for their recipient or not. If they decline it for whatever reason, we're going to move on to the next, and we just keep going down. Okay. So during when all this is going on, we're still in the ICU. We still have a family care team there in the hospital supporting that family. The family's welcome to stay through this whole process to keep them up to date, help them with whatever they need, and. And we're just trying to maintain the donor because, like I said, they're real unstable. So we need them to, to stay stable until we can get to, you know, the OR. Once we find a recipient, that patient, the recipient patient, is brought into the transplant center hospital. Like they say here, say the kidney recipient, um, the, the surgeon accepts for his recipient number 25 on the list. Well, if it's here, it'll be Methodist. So they're gonna, that patient, the one that needs the kidney, is going to go into Methodist and start getting worked up. So they're going to put lines in if they need to, go ahead and do paperwork with that recipient, lab work, whatever they need to do, okay? Depending on if, they're, if it's a heart patient, when it needs a heart, they're going to put in a pulmonary artery catheter, get them ready, get them admitted to the hospital. Um, once we've placed all the organs, we have to organize the recovery. So that's dependent on operating room availability at the hospital. The procurement takes place in the same hospital where the patient's been. We don't move their patients, okay? So all the surgeons that are accepting organs for their recipient fly in or drive in, just depending where they're from. So you might have like a heart surgeon coming in from Texas, and you might have a kidney surgeon coming in from down the street, and then you might have a lung surgeon coming in from Illinois, and they're all going to fly in at the same time and meet in the same OR and try to be civil. So, <laughs> um, that's, that's one of the bigger challenges that we have. It's real hard because everybody, you know, if your patient's super, super sick, you want to get here as soon as possible because, you know, the recipient might be actively working on dying in the hospital, you know. But then you might have somebody, you know, that's flying in from somewhere else that's really busy that has to go for two procurements for four years. So, you have to try to meet in the middle to set a day or time, and it can be hard. So, we said the recovery that it occurs in the OR of the hospital where the donor patient was admitted. Um, procurements, it's, they're always performed by certi certified transplant surgeons. So, we're never going to have, you know, like sometimes people ask me, like, do I procure organs? I'm like, no, <laughs> no. Um, it has to be, I mean, you have to be a board certified transplant surgeon to procure organs for transplant. Um, the heart comes out first, always. Um, it's just more time sensitive, it needs the oxygen. So, if the heart comes out first, those people leave, and we all stay in the OR. Then the lungs come out, then those people leave. And then after that, it goes in this order, liver, pancreas, intestines, the kidneys come out last. And it's just, it's based on what organs do best or worse with the least amount of oxygen. So kidneys can actually stay out of the body for about 24 hours before transplant. Heart, it's about four, so it just depends. So the whole recovery process can take between two and six hours, and that's just highly dependent on what organs we're preparing. If we're preparing like liver and kidneys, and that's all, then it's going to take two. If we're recovering, if we're doing like a seven organ donor, it's going to take six hours. So post recovery, the, the patient sutured back up, just like you would after any other chest or abdominal surgery. Um, if the patient was a tissue donor, whether they had designated that themselves or their family designated it for them. That process can begin after that. Um, we notify the family when it's completed and then the patient is transported to the morgue and then we also notify the funeral home so that they can come and pick them up and get them there as quick as possible. We make it a goal to not ever let this interfere with, you know, burial plans, funeral plans. So the recipients like I said, while this is all going on, they're going to be at their hospitals. Um, the recipients are cared for by the transplant team. They have their transplant doctors. They also have a pre-transplant coordinator, which is a nurse, and a post-transplant coordinator, which is also a nurse. They kind of help them through their process, like while they're on the wait list and after they have their surgery, the recovery process. Follow-up care, it's usually just the ICU for a day or two, even heart transplant recipients. And then they're, they're out of the ICU, extubated, and just routine office checkups after that. They have to take lifelong immunosuppressive meds, and that's usually like three or four tabs a day, and they're very, very expensive. <clears throat> this is your wait list. This is as of this month. 
So this is nationwide, and you can see the kidney list, how large it is. And that's why I said, like, we might have a list where for one organ there's 9,000 people on it. That's kidney support. Um, but it just goes down, and then here's your total. So we like to say, just as like a visual, that's about two Liberty Bowls filled out of people that are waiting on, on transplants in this country. Um, one of the things that we consider is just multicultural needs. So, I mean, everyone has got the same needs, regardless of race, race, or ethnicity. Ugh, I can't talk today, I'm sorry. But um, certain minority groups are more widely affected by diseases that cause the need for the transplant. So, y'all probably learned in class, um, African Americans are more likely to have hypertension and diabetes, and they're a lot more likely to need a kidney transplant. So half of the people on the national waiting list are minorities, but about 25% of our donors are minorities, and that's nationwide. So what we do a lot is uh, to try to work with the minority communities to just bring awareness and dispel myths about organ donation. Um, we partner with a lot of the religious communities and churches, health fairs, try to go to schools, try to go to colleges, just to educate people. And um, we have got what we call a life requester plan. And so this involves where our minority staff are the ones that approach the minority families in the hospitals for consent for organ donation. It seems to help just build a better um, rapport with the families um, and a sense of trust. Because it is, you know, I mean, it is a big deal. So these are just some myths and misconceptions. How are we doing on time? I'm going to go over these real quick. Because um, this is the biggest one we hear. If emergency room doctors know you're an organ and tissue donor, they won't work. Won't work as hard to save you. That's by far the biggest one. And what's important to remember is that the people that are working hard to save you have no idea if you're a registered organ or tissue donor or not. They don't even have to come know who you are. Okay? I don't mean, but I don't mean that ugly, but like literally, it's a med. They come in as unknown trauma. They don't even have a name. So they, they don't know. Um, they're trying to save your life. We come in. Only once nothing they have done has worked are we even a part of that process, okay? And really to stabilize you so you can be an organ donor, you really actually wind up getting a lot more treatment. I see that a lot. Would you agree with that? I mean, the patients that are potential organ donors, that they usually are going to get more aggressive treatment than those that aren't, just in case. So you're preserving both. You want to primarily want to save that patient's life, but you also want to Restore, you want to keep that option for donation available in case that you can't. Um, donation will disfigure my body. So it doesn't. We work really hard um, with the organ donation. It's just an incision that's left, like you would have any other surgery, and it's sutured back together by a surgeon. So it does not, even a lot of the um, tissue donation, it does not interfere with having an open casket service. Okay? The cost, and that was one that you brought up. You know, we cover all the costs related to donation, all of that. So the ICU bed, any procedures that we do, any lab tests, all of those we pay for. Um, wealthy and famous individuals are more likely to receive a transplant. So this one, um, you know, when you're put on the list, it obviously doesn't take into account who you are or what your income status is. But it's based on the severity of your illness, the time you spent waiting, what your blood type is. Like, are you going to be a tissue match for this donor? Are you not? And then also, what is your outcome going to be? If you are 75 years old and you need a kidney, and a kidney comes up and the donor is 20, you're probably not going to be real high on that list because that kidney is going to way outlive you. Does that make sense? You can give a kidney to another 20-year-old, and that 20-year-old isn't going to need another transplant in five years. So they try to kind of base it like that, too. You can sell your organs, no. It's against federal law. Um, and then medical history and age. There are things in medical history that will be an automatic rule of organization, but there aren't many. There aren't any at all. Um, HIV, as of right now, we're not transplanting HIV donors into even, even into HIV positive recipients. That's, that might be something in the future, but not now. But we are transplanting hep C donors into hep C recipients. So there's differences in age. I mean, we really don't rule out for donation until they get up over 80. So that's too, not too much of a big deal either. So I think the important thing to remember is through transplantation, we're always just trying to save somebody else's life. Uh, first and foremost, we always want our loved members to recover from their own injuries. 
But in the instance that that cannot happen and never will, we look at transplantation as an opportunity for that person to save other people's lives. Potentially up to eight through organ donation and up to hundreds improving lives through tissue donation. And with the family, you know, what we always respect their wishes. So the family gets to call the shots. If they want this organ to go here, we try to do it if that patient can match. If they want to donate this but not this, that's fine. If they want to donate but they all want it done in 24 hours, we respect that too as much as we can. Okay. So I have any questions? None? Okay. With the with the apnea test that you specified if the PCO2 is already elevated, then what are you looking at? If it's already it's that I specify that it needs to be normal. Okay. But like it needs to be normal. Is ideal. Okay. So if the PCA2 was, was 50, and then the post was 61, I mean... That's still positive. It, yeah, it's still positive, but really you want your PCA2 normal. Okay. So you just hyperventilate them to get it down, and then... Have yeah, that's what okay. you should do, is if you okay. do one and the PCA2 is 50, you should do make your vent changes that you need to, and then go back and get another one in 30 minutes. Okay. And keep doing, and I've actually seen them do it where we sat there with an ISAT machine, like a portable lab machine, and um, made vent changes and just sat there for that stuff for like 10 or 15 minutes, getting gases like every like two minutes until we got a normal one. And, and, then then it. Okay. and there's not many diseases that will rule out a patient from being an organ donor, but what are the ones that will rule a patient out? Okay. Um, so, HIV, I mentioned active hep B. We'll rule them out, which is kind of funny because Hep C might. But Hep C is a chronic disease, and so if you have a Hep C liver and you put it into a Hep C patient, it's gonna, you know, they've got a lot of time for that liver to become cirrhotic. And Hep B can cause like fulminant hepatic failure. So you can put a Hep B liver into somebody, and they can go into total liver failure just out of nowhere, kind of. So we don't transplant Hep B organs. Um, Toxoplasmosis, active toxoplasmosis would probably be a rule out. Um, trying to think of what else. Most of the other ones are pretty obscure. Uh, West Nile virus actually is a rule out, like current West Nile virus infection. What about yeah. cancer patients? Mm -hmm. cancer. Cancer's usually a rule out, um, totally. So like if I get a phone call about a patient that has current like lung cancer, I'm not even It'll be ruled out on the phone. What if they're in remission? Who? Okay, I'm sorry. I was like trying to look. If they're in remission, it, it would depend on the type of cancer and how long. Like if somebody had prostate cancer five years ago, that's fine, mm -hmm. and they're in remission. But um, if somebody has, and if somebody has like like a benign like brain lesion, that's okay too. But if somebody's got like anything active, it certainly we wouldn't because we would have to worry about that. Mm -hmm. And a, a lot of times, if we're even if we're doing the procurement. And notice lesions while we're in the OR. We'll send that off to the pathology lab. They'll right away identify it with it's malignant. All right. Um, so, <laughs> what, what we need to talk about today, I hate to be insensitive, but it's just ridiculous in my opinion to do that. So, yeah. I think it's ridiculous as well. Yeah. So, um, we need to cover today spinal cord injuries is the bulk of what we need to talk about. Also, we will review uh, Parkinson's and ALS. Um, there are some videos to be shown, but I doubt that I'll have time to show them to you, so be sure to watch the videos at home. Hopefully everybody watched the video from last time that I tried to show and kept you know, not loading well. So, um, spinal cord injury. So remember, the function of the spinal cord is, is basically a communication pathway between the lower motor neurons and the brain. So, you know, they have the afferent pathways and the, and the impulses come from the brain. Afferent means away, A for away. So those impulses come from the brain away into the spinal cord into the lower motor neuron. So it's a communication uh, between the lower motor and the brain. Also, um, the spinal cord acts uh, by, ha by controlling reflexes and also sensation and motor movement and things like that. All right? Causes of a spinal cord injury, here you go. Usually it's some sort of compression or contusion, um, which could be caused by a vertebral fracture, hemorrhage, blood vessel damage. So if you have bleeding around the spinal cord, what's going to happen? 
that blood doesn't have a lot of place to go, so it's just going to build up and compress the spinal cord. So it's a compression from bleeding. You can have a contusion, maybe from a motor vehicle accident, and the patient has had severe trauma to their back or their neck, and the um, spinal cord has been contused, meaning that has this cord itself has been damaged. The contusion, I think, more basically like a bruise on something. All right. So what happens is somehow the spinal cord is damaged um, for for some reason, and the um, you know like it says often vertebrae as well because the vertebrae protect the spinal cord, and if, if there's enough trauma to damage the spinal cord, usually you'll have vertebral fractures as well. So for some reason you have spinal cord damage. Um, the, the the vertebrae breaking may might be the cause of the damage, but you have bleeding within the cord of the gray and the white matter. And basically, it's, it's neural tissue, um, and therefore, if it becomes ischemic, it dies. And therefore, loss of function happens below the level of injury. Right? That's an important key to understand. When the, when the, the spinal cord is damaged, uh, neuroreceptors, uh, transmitters are, are released, like norepinephrine, serotonin, dopamine, and histamine, and those... Uh, nor, uh, neuroreceptors or transmitters cause, you know, the mechanism of most of them can cause vasoconstriction. So therefore, it inhibits even further the ischemia to that area of the spinal cord. If it is not um, corrected immediately, very quickly, the spinal cord area will actually die and the cord will become necrotic. So therefore, once something is necrotic, there's no going back, right? So there's a very short period of time that you can have improvements. Um, Usually it's an acceleration, deceleration injury that is causing this problem, but also hyperflexion and hyperextension. You think of that when you think about cervical injuries, hyperextension and flexion of the, of the neck, right? So the head going back very far or forward. I think there's a picture coming up, right? Yeah. So here the cord is being stretched by force. So what happens is this, this anterior ligament is torn and the patient's head is is uh, hyperextended there, and therefore you have stretching of that cord. So if you stretch something out, you're going to rip the center of it. Um, here you've got some compression of the spinal cord because you have maybe a compression fracture of the vertebrae, and that is compressing. It's pushing outward onto the spinal cord here. So therefore you're going to have the skin due to that. Here what is happening is is that you have uh, this the the head bending forward, and the the uh, this C5 here has actually shifted forward and the C6 has shifted back, and the, the, the disc is pushed into the spinal cord. So it's compression as well. When you think about a spinal cord injury, the spinal cord injury is classified based on where the injury occurs. So you might have in the past thought about a quadriplegic, and that means that the person can't move anything with their head. That's not necessarily true. A quadriplegic has a cervical injury. Usually, most of the body function is impaired. Um, the arms, usually in a quadriplegic, that, that's the area that can be spared. So the patient may have gross motor movement of their arms, but they don't have fine motor function. They can't pick anything up, but they can move their arm. Just when they can move, they're still a quadriplegic. Okay. A paraplegic. Um, usually we'll have uh, a T, a, a thoracic injury, and this person um, will have function of their of the upper part of their body, so the arms work pretty well. Maybe they have pretty good posture, and they breathe easily. So um, this person is a paraplegic. Hmm? Their, no their arms would be normal. Right. Normal. Okay. Complete versus incomplete. This is basically what this means is has the spinal cord been severed? Um, that would be a complete spinal cord injury, or the cord that is distal has become necrotic, so that would be a complete loss. Sometimes we have some some sensations and motor movements that are intact while others are gone. So the patient may be a paraplegic, but they're incomplete. So therefore they can feel everything, but they can't move. So does that make sense? So that's an incomplete injury.
again, where the injury happens depends on what the manifestations are going to be. So if you have a C1 or a C2 spinal cord injury, what's going to happen to that patient? Yeah. They're probably going to die, right? That's because um, the, the patient will not breathe. There wouldn't be time to get them on the ventilator. Sometimes we do. Sometimes we can save them. But then you think, what kind of quality of, quality of life is this person going to have? That's just C1 and C1 and C2. C1 and 2, yeah. Usually that person does not have a good outcome. Right. You can have lower cervical injuries and the patient will, will has better prognosis, but still they will have lots and lots of problems if it had any cervical. Um, have I jumped ahead too much? Is there a slide that I've talked more about that? Yeah, there is. Um, so basically, the most common sites are, are the, the, um, the lower back and the upper L spine. Um, if there is injury to lower motor neurons, that equals flaccidity. And if there's injury to the upper motor neurons, that's uh, spastic, spasticity. It's just a memorization. Um, initially, there can be trauma to the area of the spinal cord, and there may just simply be edema. So, hopefully, after that edema resolves, neurological function will return. Sometimes that happens. Um, but after a period of time, if this person still does not have uh, any function, there is more and more of a chance that the patient will never have. Usually, um, if, the, if the edema and the inflammation is not corrected very soon, within a day or so, there is little um, chance that it will, will return. But just because the edema has been resolved within that first 24 hours, it means that immediately they're going to start moving. Sometimes it takes time for it to, to return. This is a, a key here that below the level of injury, Perspiration doesn't really happen very much, so therefore you have impaired thermoregulation because of that. Again, the upper C spine one and two, three is also bad, but the upper cervical injuries usually are fatal. C4 not as fatal, but still you have severe. Um, uh, impairment of the muscles in the upper body, so therefore there will be respiratory compromise. C4 at 5 through 7, a lower C-spine, has um, lower risk of having in, um, respiratory complications. So basically the person, if, if C1, which probably would never live, so but basically if they have C1 through 4 injury, this person probably will be on a vent long term. The person five through seven may be able to come off of the vent long term. If your diaphragm doesn't work, you're not going to breathe, right? The how, long, the, yes. how long can you live on a ventilator? A long time. That's a long time. Decades sometimes. I it 10, 20 years. I've seen patients that have stuck around for a long time on a ventilator. They don't start having heart problems or? They could, yeah. but. But yeah, sometimes it's, it's rare that they would live that long, but they can live for several years. Yeah, usually they'll die from something else. Like what? Sepsis, uh, bed sore. Yeah. Who? Like Superman. Christopher Reeves. Yeah, Christopher Reeves. What did he die? He died. He died. He Neurological condition did he have? Yeah. He didn't have, I don't think he had a spinal cord injury, did he? Yeah. 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 Okay, there's maybe somebody something that yeah. uh, he probably died of something else. Pneumonia. Pneumonia. A complication, okay. probably. Yeah. Yeah. So usually it's a complication that they'll die from. They usually come into us into the ICU from, from home or from a nursing home or a long term acute care place and they, they've got pneumonia or they've got a terrible bed sore, they're septic, they die of septic shock. Mm -hmm. They don't die because of their spinal cord injury. A person with a thoracic spinal cord injury, they will have a uh, that we would call them, again, a paraplegic usually, and that person um, will have um, more, para they have paraplegia below the level of injury again. So this person usually has okay respiratory function, but again, below the injury, so they'll have risk for uh, bowel and bladder 
this function. Lumbar, they can also have a risk of bladder and bowel dysfunction. Lumbar will also have um, motor weakness or motor dysfunction of the lower extremities. <clears throat> so again, the person that's the quad, that's when they have a cervical injury. Um, and then this person will have impaired breathing, impaired communication related to their um, ventilation status, um, and their position change and tolerance. So these people have decreased vasomotor tone. So that means that the body does not compensate basically at all with position changes. When we sit down and stand up, our sympathetic nervous system says, hey, we need to squeeze the vessels a little bit, keep the blood pressure up, so that we don't stand up and pass out. The person that is a quadriplegic, if you go from the lane supine and then sit them up to 90 degrees, there's a big risk that might just go out on them because their body is unable to cause that vasoconstriction. The, the body does not communicate with the brain because there is a spinal cord injury. We can do things to help prevent this. Um, we can, we can um, basically have the body practicing. So the tilt table. So the tilt table is, is what it sounds like. It's a table and it will tilt and it changes the patient's position. And um, we can help kind of get the patient's body used to changes in positions. TEDs and SCDs help with um, blood return to the heart. So it helps to push the blood back up. And a normal person by walking and moving our legs that happens, but this person has no motor movement in the lower extremity, so they need some help. So TEDs and NCDs can help with the movement of the blood from the legs. An abdominal binder also helps do the same thing in multiple posture. If the person has had a cervical spinal cord injury, they need to have their C spine immobilized. Right? Um, or if they just simply have a cervical fracture. If they have a cerve cervical vertebral fracture with no spinal cord injury, we want to prevent a spinal cord injury by immobilizing their C-spine. The primary way that we do that is by putting a cervical collar on the patient. You've seen lots of these. Right? We can also put the patient into traction. This is not an extremely common thing to do. Usually they would just put a rigid C-spine collar on the patient, but we can uh, put the patient in traction. So this, these are uh, crutch bell tongs, um, and the, the pins are placed into the skull here on either side. This device is put on it, and the patient is, and that piece is attached to weights with this pulley system. So just like you've probably seen a patient in cervical or in skeletal traction with their leg or something like that, it's cervical traction. It keeps that spine in alignment. General care with cervical with traction is you know that you should not remove the weights. Um, it's, it's not a, with cervical traction, I would never remove the weights. Never. But if the patient is in, in leg traction, sometimes you have to. You can let, let pressure off if you're pulling the patient up in the bed because it's going to be very painful if you're pulling the patient against all that weight. But usually what ends up happening is that you have, with, with the lower extremity traction, you can remove the weight a little bit. With cervical, be much more careful because you don't want to paralyze or kill your patient, okay? It's more severe. The weights should hang freely, and the ropes should be in the pulleys, not beside the pulley, and the weights should not be touching anything. Remember, it shouldn't be touching the bed because that affects how much weight is being pulled on this traction. The tong sites, right? So remember, pin site or tong site care, half water, half peroxide. Some facilities say just use water or saline. Depends on your facility to watch. Look confused. So. Peroxide's hard on the skin. That's why I said a 50 50 solution, or some facilities say it don't use peroxide. Okay. Yep. This patient um, should still be moved. Just because they're in traction doesn't mean that we can't turn them a little bit. You don't want to do a lot of movement with them, but they still need to be taken off of their backside every two hours. They turn them. So be very careful. What I do is I use two wedge pillows, and I keep and so I make the wedge really long, keep the body nice aligned. You should have two people turning the patient, and one person putting the wedges. 
So here's Meemaw. It looks like that she, it looks like that she broke her neck. Okay. So um, we can also um, place the patient who has a cervical uh, uh, or a vertebral fracture in in the C in the C spine. Uh, we often they will put them in halo traction, and this is not fun. But basically, what happens with this is that there are four pin sites here, two in the front and two in the back. This halo is placed on it, and then it is, a, it is a, attached to the, to the vest with these bars. Um, and this keeps the head very still and very straight, and the patient might be in this for several weeks. So, um, the, the patient, there's lots of care that goes with the patient. Again, pin site care, the patient shouldn't get this vest all wet. And um, we should promote a diet that is that improves bone healing and um, positioning. Change the patient's position so it would be very hard to set up. So you have to teach them to roll on their side and push themselves to a sitting position. This patient should not drive, right, because they can't turn their head. Um, so, and the vest should be all nice and tight, but not too tight so that circulation is impaired or pressure ulcers are developed. Right? Initially, the person for a, a potential, even a, a suspected spinal cord injury, uh, assessment of their respiratory status and immobilization of their C-spine is priority. So, if, you know, as, as a nurse, I'm the nurse that doesn't stop the help. If I see somebody that is fell out of the help at the grocery store, but if there's a car accident, I'm not, I just don't stop. Some people do. Um, you don't have to. You don't have to. In, in California, you have to. But I, I just, what am I going to do? But if you do stop and you do help, what should you do? Hold us, hold us feet, hold the C spine. What else are you going to do? Patient's in a car accident. I can't feel my feet. I'm going to lay here. Have somebody call 911. I'm just going to hold this head and take care of this feet. That's all you can do. Okay? That is the priority. Because if they have a cervical spinal cord injury, there's a high risk that they would live. Right? So, but I, just, I, just, I don't stop. Some people do. I said, what am I You know? But, um, but I would have to stop. No, you hold it so that it doesn't move. Just keep it in a line. So just imagine that the patient had a seized collar on and make their head look. You don't, you just don't so that the person will probably, if you've ever been in a car accident that is bad, probably the person who thinks was like, oh my God, is everything okay? Get up and move around. I'm fine, I'm fine, I'm fine. Well, you want to encourage this person. Lay down, let me just hold your head. So, but anyhow, so, so stabilization of the C-spine is priority. So if you ever decide to stop, I mean, I'm not encouraging you to do this but um, that's what you should try to do if you suspect at all a spinal cord injury, okay? Medications that can help with, um, with spinal cord injuries, one is corticosteroids. So again, these medications help to decrease inflammation. So therefore, it can prevent edema, which can lead to a spinal cord injury, right? So if we can get that edema down soon, hopefully we can eventually have some return of function. If the patient is in a state of shock, if they've lost vasomotor tone, their, their periphery is not vasoconstricting and maintaining a blood pressure, well, we can give them vasopressors, which you guys are pretty good about, or know a good bit about. Leave the fed, norepinephrine, epinephrine, and all those things. This is a later treatment, baclofen. It's a medication, it's an antispasmodic. And the patient with a spinal cord injury often has lots of spasms. So they can be very painful. So we can give baclofen. Uh, so know a little bit about baclofen to help prevent the patient's spasms. We can do a decompression laminectomy. Well, we don't, the physician does. but. Um, and that is to decompress any pressure on the cord, hopefully to restore perfusion to it and to restore function. Uh, they can also do a spinal fusion if you have that vertebral fracture, which is, you know, led to the spinal cord injury. They can fuse those vertebrae together to immobilize that area and hopefully fix those vertebrae. You have a spinal fusion. Usually you're going to have, um, obviously you would have at least two vertebrae together. Usually it's three. They'll fuse at one time. You know what a fusion is? What's a laminectomy? Put them all together. A laminectomy, they go in and simply decompress the cord, evacuate a clot or something like that. They go into the, the vertebral canal.
complications of a spinal cord injury. We call these things complications of autonomic dysfunction. So basically, one thing, the first thing that would happen to the patient if they're going to have it is spinal shock. So because there is loss of impulses and sensation below the injury, and there's paralysis, there's no reflexes, there's no autonomic function. So therefore, the sympathetic tone is lost. So therefore, the body is unable to cause vasoconstriction, things like that to maintain blood pressure. It's a spinal shock. So the patient has, again, vasodilation. They're going to try to compensate by um, the heart can increase, but often you will have a decrease in heart rate because there is no sympathetic or vasomotor tone. The blood pressure will fall, the temperature is affected. You will have a decreased stroke volume, afterload, and preload. Of course, if you have all that, you'll have decreased cardiac output, right? This can occur very quickly, and it can last for a while. We talked about cardiogenic, septic, hypovolemic, now spinal shock, and you already knew about anaphylactic shock, and shock patient. All right? Very good. We know that spinal shock is resolving if we see movement in the patient. So if there are spastic movements, that tells us that the spinal shock is beginning to resolve. The reflexes may come back. And after this is when we may use baclofen to control the spasticity because before that, there won't be any spastic movements. It's complete paralysis. Initially, the patient will also have no rectal sphincter tone, but after the shock has resolved, the patient's rectal sphincter tone may return. I think of spinal shock and neurogenic shock is basically the same thing. All right. Neurogenic shock is more widespread. The patient is more severe, more critical. The patient requires more support. So it's neurogenic shock is an exaggerated spinal shock. All right. After spinal shock and the neurogenic shock have resolved, another complication can occur, which is called autonomic dysreflexia. Usually this will only occur if the patient has had a spinal cord injury at T6 or above. What happens is that somewhere below the level of injury, there's some sort of uh, stimulus. Um, and the stimulus is usually a, a overfilled bladder, bladder distension, or uh, constipation or, or uh, fecal impaction. So what happens below the level of injury, the, the body is realizing, the peripheral nervous system is realizing that something is wrong down here, but it's unable to communicate it to the brain. So it becomes exaggerated. So below the level of injury, there's severe vasoconstriction, um, and therefore that would cause pallor, which is paleness, right? Above the level of injury, you will see the opposite. You will see vasodilation, sweating, and maybe pyloerection of goosebumps, right? This autonomic dysreflex, remember the spinal shock, neurogenic shock causes hypotension. Autonomic dysreflexia causes hypertension. There's a stimulus. There's a decreased communication between the lower part of the body and the upper half of the body. Below there's vasoconstriction, above there's vasodilation. And that results in hypertension. So this patient could become extremely hypertensive and bradycardic as a compensatory issue. Um, and it puts the patient at the risk for the risk of seizures, hemorrhages in the eyes, and hemorrhages in the brain. Your first intervention if you assess that a patient is going into autonomic dysreflexia, just raise the head of the bed. Because often, when the patient have when the patients have these spinal cord injuries, by raise, changing their position very quickly does what? Drops their blood pressure, right? So hopefully, 
we can get that reaction out of them by raising the head of the bed, and hopefully we can get their blood pressure down a little bit. Next, you will try to assess for the cause. Usually, it is distended bladder. So these patients with spinal cord injuries will have bowel and bladder issues, right? They can have, they can have uh, incontinence or they can have infection. So maybe the patient has been drinking lots of fluid that day, and they're unable to feel the sensation of the void, and they don't have the motor time to the void, so they need in-out calves. Maybe their calves are ordered TID. This patient has, an, has had an exceptionally large amount of fluid today that you were unaware of. Family problem, you know? Um, so you might want to just calf the patient, right? And hopefully we can get a bunch of fluid out of there, a bunch of urine out of there, and that can resolve it. If the patient has, the patient has an indwelling or a fluid catheter, you can irrigate the catheter. A lot of times, patients that have been in for a long time, those fluid catheters can get clogged on the ends. Therefore, if we irrigate it, we can dislodge that, that clot, and hopefully the bladder will drain. You can assess for fecal impaction. You can do a rectal exam. Um, you can encourage the, the, the physician to order an abdominal x-ray. But you don't necessarily want to um, de-impact the patient immediately because that can cause a, a uh, opposite reaction and the patient will quickly drop their blood pressure because their vagus uh, nerve, it's a nerve 10, can be stimulated and the patient can drop the pressure very quickly. So just go opposite. So you can assess for a fecal infection, but don't go trying to de-impact them without calling the physician first. Okay? As a nurse, we cannot do that. It's not our scope. Practice. It is within your scope of practice to de-impact the patient. Yes. I think the nature of this disease is You always have to have an order, though, right? But you can, but you can do it. Right. What don't we, like we, don't, we never do some things. Like you never do a part of so I don't care if the physician orders it. Oh, I'm not doing it, right? <laughs> um, I'd say that's without my scope. That's outside my scope of practice. But you can de impact the patient with an order. Is it within your scope of practice to get morphine? Absolutely. If you need an order, absolutely, right? So, another thing that might be causing a problem is that, or not causing a problem, but con contributing to it is the TEDs, right? Mm -hmm. So, this patient probably want to keep these TEDs on, TEDs and the SCDs on. So we can take them off to help hopefully relieve some of that pressure and decrease the blood pressure. So if these interventions are not completely effective, we can put the patient on a potent vasodilator uh, uh, called Nipride. And this simply works on alpha. Remember, like Epi and, and Leofed work on alpha by causing vasoconstriction. But Nipride works on alpha by causing vasodilation. Remember, I'm not going to make you learn the words, which one's an agonist, which one's an antagonist. It works on alpha to cause vasodilation. Okay. Because that's the problem here, right? The patient has severe vasoconstriction. It's an exaggerated sympathetic response below the level of anger that's unable to communicate with the upper half of the body. So therefore we can say, okay, we need some vasodilation here. We can we can give them that right. I like these pictures. So T6, the the level of injury is at T6. Are, are above usually, and the the um, there is stimulus below, right? This could be a cause bladder number one, right? We talk about the complication of muscle spasms. We can use baclofen for that. The patient can have pain. Often in our patients, especially when they're quads, they will still complain of pain. Remember that they can still have sensation. It may be an incomplete pair or quadriplegic. They still have sensations, they just can't move. So if they can't move, if you've ever laid in a position, I have slept for you know maybe 16 hours or something, you've been working for days, mm -hmm. and then you get up and you are pretty stiff and you hurt and you move around, right? Well imagine that permanently. And so it's painful, right? If the patient's moved. So the patient can still feel pain. Often the patient will not have a sen have sensation and they still will report signs. You know, I have a headache, my, my whatever hurts. Um, and it's not our place to judge and say, I think I'm hurt, you don't even feel anything. Right? Even might think that. Well, she's being um, unethical by doing so. Right? <laughs> <laughs> so, if your patient requests pain medication and disorder, certainly give. Okay? 
patient has complications of UTI because these patients, all of them, will have some sort of impaired bladder function, right? So they may have a Foley catheter, they may be getting in and out catheters. They, may, they often, I mean, hopefully they will eventually go home and therefore they will have to cat themselves and this is 90% of the time not a similar situation. So some patients actually boil their catheters and reuse them. Hyperperfusion related to the vasoconstriction that might occur because of, of the autonomic dysreflexia. Oops, I couldn't spell that day. Pneumonia. We <laughs> talked about pneumonia as a complication of a spinal cord injury because often they have respiratory complications. The diaphragm is impaired. They don't have, a, they don't have effective airway clearance. Maybe they're on the vent. Maybe they have a tray. Pressure ulcers, obviously because of impaired mobility, Impotence usually occurs. Contractures because of the spasticity that can happen with these injuries. There's continuous spasticity or flexion of the, of the joints and the muscles, and so the contractures can happen. So we can help prevent that by doing passive range of motion very frequently on these people and also teaching them to do so at home, teaching their caregivers, their families to do that. Ankylosis is actually a complication of a complication which is contractures, but these the joints can actually fuse together. So the, the joint can wear down and the bone will actually ankylize and it's the consolidation of the joint and it will never move again basically unless there's surgery. Now nutrition, these patients often will have to have what? Assistance with eating. So these patients are at risk for dehydration and malnutrition. And the paralytic ileus, and that's due to gastric immobility, right? Any questions about this? We talked about the incontinence. Depression and psychosocial issues are a big deal with patients with spinal cord injuries. Loss of function, loss of, of um, normal lifestyle is a big deal to these people. Fractures in renal calculi, the calcium in the blood often becomes elevated because the patient is immobile. So the one way that, that calcium moves into the bones is by movement of the bones and the pounding on the bones by walking and things like that, it stimulates the movement of the calcium into the bones. But when there's no movement and there's immobility, the calcium moves into the vascular space. So therefore it's not in the bones, it's for fractures. And if it's in the vascular, vascular space, you remember that renal calculi are often caused by, or 80% of the time caused by calcium. Infection, often due to pressure ulcers, pneumonia. Stress ulcers, remember that's in the, in the stomach. Pulmonary edema, the patient may actually have a risk of heart failure. Um, so, you know, cardiac complications. DBT is due to immobility, and the pulmonary embolism would be a risk, a risk factor of the risk factor, right? DBT. I think this is a video on this lady who is a spinal cord uh, patient, and she has um, uh, participated in a study in which they put something up to her brain, and she can make things move. Really good. Anybody watching? Is that right? <laughs> See, spinal cord injury isn't too bad, right? So, if you thought that was exciting. Parkinson's is really exciting. So, uh, Parkinson's disease. So, this is an imbalance between neurotransmitters. Um, we, you, hopefully, you've learned about the difference in the, between the excitatory and the inhibitory neurotransmitters, but if not, that's okay. This is a disease that is not very acute. It doesn't happen overnight. It's a very progressive disease that gets worse and worse over a couple of decades. And it's diagnosed later in age. Um, men are more affected. So dopamine is inhibitory. All right. So for some reason, the neurons in the brain atrophy, um, and the, uh, the the dopamine uh, degenerates. We have decreased dopamine receptors in the brain, and we have a decrease in the level of dopamine being produced. So, dopamine is inhibitory, acetylcholine is excitatory. 
So because these two neurotransmitters, dopamine and acetylcholine, keep each other in check. They do checks and balances together. And an old person, they communicate very well. But the person who has Parkinson's, the theory is that they have a decrease in dopamine. So therefore, acetylcholine predominates over that. So we have these effects of the excitatory functions of acetylcholine. Does that make sense? We have some classic manifestations of um, Parkinson's. One of them is called the uh, uh, motor or the cogwheel rigidity, which is motor dysfunction. Um, and these three things here, there's there's a classic triad of motor dysfunction. So it's cogwheel rigidity, bradykinesia, dyskinesia, and resting or non-intention tremors. So cogwheel rigidity is where you have these small jerky movements when uh, the muscles are moved. It also has to do with if you say legs, it has to do with the patient's gait. So they have a, they take short little steps, and they, they don't, they don't very easily raise their feet up when they take a step. So they're shuffling. We call it a shuffling. Gait. They have difficulty um, getting movement started. So they, they're slow to start, um, and once they get started, um, they have discoordinated functions. It's not, or it can't happen that the patient is moving and walking, and then they just become unable to move, so they become frozen and can't move. They have to get started again. This is the key here: the resting or non-intention tremors. Um, the uh, the deal with this is that there's fine jerking, rhythmic motions. Um, I, you probably would notice the most in the hands of a patient. Um, but you have a resting tremor. So that means that as the patient is resting, their hands or wherever it's affected is jerking. Mm -hmm. But as they go to pick up a cup to drink it, it stops and they can do it if they can get it started. Okay. So the resting, the tremors happen at rest. Okay. There's a disease that we'll learn about later that have intention tremors. So Parkinson's has non-intention tremors. Another uh, um, Phenomenon here is this pill rolling activity, and they will, do, as if you had a pill in your hand and you're constantly rolling it. All right, so they just, it's just, it's a movement they can't, they can't control. So it's a, it's a, a non-intention. You remember what echolalia is? The repetition, saying something over and over again. It's they just to, to get it out. All right, so because they have these impaired uh, motor uh, functions, there's a big, in, big risk of Injury, falls, fractures, impaired communication, the inability to move the mouth appropriately. Their, their voice will change in Parkinson's. The, um, the vocal cords become dysfunctional. I think there might be a bit. I had a video at one time about that, but I think that it wasn't available anymore. But there was a study that was done not long ago about how to maybe uh, detect Parkinson's before it becomes severe. And you could um, simply detect it with their voice. So it was, it's really neat. So you could hear the trembling in their voice um, before you could see any other neuro or motor dysfunctions. The patient has other risk factors here. Um, I'm not exactly sure why the patient has a risk of seborrheic dermatitis. This is dry scalp, right? Um, so. Hyperhidrosis, that's increased sweating. They have an intolerance to heat. And also postural. Right. They don't only have motor dysfunctions, but they can, they can also have cognitive dysfunctions. Dementia, anxiety, depression. Okay. I told you it was exciting. So the patient with Parkinson's, uh, we want to focus on maintaining and increasing their strength to decrease their risk for falls. Um, they can work with physical therapy, occupational therapy to uh, develop some uh, exercises to do so.
you can teach them to do certain things to improve their mobility and decrease their risk for falls. Like I said, they, they have they often have the pro problem lifting their toes as they're taking steps. So tell them to to remind themselves to lift your their foot up, lift your toes up when you're walking. Take a wider wider steps, widen your gait so that you can increase your stability. All right. Tight corner manipulation. This person has problems. If you were to put them into a corner, they would have problems getting out of it. If you're turning around or you put them back in the back of the classroom or in all those desks, they would have a really hard time getting out of it because they don't have that motor function to do so. So you can give them, you know, um, activities and things to do to so that they can um, practice manipulating small spaces. All right. Speech becomes an issue, so you can tell them to continuously practice speech, and they may have to actually focus more on the movement of their tongue and their mouth so that they can articulate words. Any questions? All that's important. There's not necessarily a cure for Parkinson's disease. We can give medications to hopefully decrease the, side, the symptoms of it. Most of the medications that we give are going to increase dopamine because that's the problem. The medications that are the dopamine precursors are like levodopa, and that's the mainstay of Parkinson's treatment. We also have a carbidopa, levodopa uh, combination that is the cinnamon in this medication. The carbidopa works, uh, uh, what do you, how do you say, together with levodopa to create a better response, a synergistic response. Amantadine also is a dopamine precursor. Um, and this works because it says that dopamine is converted, or levodopa is converted into dopamine, um, but the brain, the body, or the brain will eventually break down the dopamine, but these, but the carbidopa can help potentiate, keep it around a bit longer. Does that make sense? What else? And the mechanism of action of amantadine is actually that it makes the central nervous system more sensitive to dopamine. If you think about it, metformin has metformin work, it makes the tissues more sensitive to insulin, right? So kind of think of those kind of things. I'll think of them too. So does the carb the carbidopa just basically helps keep the dopamine around longer? Right. It prevents the conversion of um, or the breakdown of dopamine in the in the body, in the tissues. So it keeps it around longer. These uh, CV complications, TA, angina, uh, and skin cancer is also a contraindication to levodopa. These medications are not going to work overnight. Um, patients should have a low protein diet, and simply because the protein binds to the medication and it makes it ineffective or in uh, inhibits it from actually working. So if there's more protein in the blood, the medication will bind to it. Avoid these foods. These medications um, are con not contraindicated, but tell the patient to avoid foods that contain this enzyme. Increase for um, reflux, gastritis, GERD, things like that. So you can give those medications to teach the patient medications to eat to prevent that as well. All right? Cardiac symptoms again, because it's contraindicated in these issues here, angina, TIA. Uh, so teach the patient if you have chest pain, dizziness, neurological changes, anything like that, to report that to the prescriber. You've heard about MAOIs. MAOBs are similar. And these medications um, um, inhibit the breakdown of dopamine. Um, often the patient will have levodopa and maybe they'll have also eldopril. It's kind of curious here that these medications can actually cause some of the side effects of Parkinson's disease, right? So the postural hypertension, you know, um, so changes in sleep, neurological changes, you know, which is better really, but um, it depends on the patient. This medication, this medication of the MAOB should not be used with Prozac and Demerol. They are, there is a reaction. 
Insomnia is a big risk factor, so make sure, or side effect, so make sure that that's reported. Um, interventions to prevent postural hypertension. Those things like that are what? Rising slowly, the rising from the bed, sit on the side of the bed for a couple minutes before you stand up. Maybe the patient can use two EVs continuously throughout the day. Put them on before you get out of bed. Increased risk for skin cancer. So regular skin exams by their primary care person or a dermatologist. And also avoid, again, runs before tyramine, because tyramine containing foods are also should be avoided in the OBs. These medications are kind of like uh, synthetic dopamine. So these medications mimic the effect of dopamine in the brain. The side effects are the same as levodopa. Often, again, it will be used with levodopa. The key here is to remember that levodopa is the mainstay of Parkinson's treatment. If these medications are stopped abruptly, the patient may have a rebound reaction. So the Parkinson's symptoms will return but being very bad. That's a rebound reaction. The COMPT inhibitors, I think of these as the Capones. Uh, so these are your Italian medications. And they all end in Capone. Um, these uh, uh, inhibit the, I'm not going to try to say that, catalomethotransferase. They inhibit COMPT, okay? And COMPT is involved uh, with the breakdown of dopamine in the body. They are uh, uh, hepatotoxic, and this medication should be very, used very cautiously in the patient who's taken warfarin primitive. Contraindicated with MAOBs, okay? cause sedation, so therefore the patient should avoid sedatives and alcohol intake. Again, the postural hypotension is a side effect. They're all about the same, right? But these are signs like the, the dark urine, if you like yellowing of the skin or, or whites of the eyes, report jaundice, okay? It's hepatotoxic. The anticholinergics uh, block the action of acetylcholine. The medication that you're probably going to see given mostly uh, that is used for this is cogentin. Again, everything is going to be added to levodopa. You're very good at the anticholinergic side effects, so bring that information back up. Uh, but anticholinergics increase the risk of glaucoma and photosensitivity, which you're aware of. If the patient is on one anticholinergic, we want to limit the use of another anticholinergic. So if they're on cogentin, don't tell them to go take antihistamines every day, right? An antihistamine causes an anticholinergic effect. Usually, if you have a medication that ends in ene, I-N-E, it has anticholinergic effects. Like an hydramine, right? An antihistamine. We talked about uh, physical therapy, occupational therapy, and speech therapy, of course, would help the patient with exercises to articulate words. This is, I got real lazy, less than body requirements. Um, I like to make up abbreviations. Um, like we don't have enough. I know, right? But you can write it up there, less than. All right, here are your nursing diagnoses. I think that you can probably figure out why the patient would be at risk for all of these things. Um, and then aspiration would be at risk for injury because the patient has impaired motor function of their mouth and neck, so they have impaired swallowing. The uh, major complication of Parkinson's is a Parkinsonian crisis. So what happens here is that usually the patient has some sort of emotional stress or the patient has abruptly stopped taking their medication. Maybe they ran out of them, whatever. Um, so what is happening here is that you have basically uh, an a re the return of Parkinson's symptoms, but they all come back threefold. They all come back very 
much more severe than they would, you know, normally. The patient is at risk for cardiac and respiratory compromise, okay? Tachycardia, hypertension, things like that. The patient becomes stressed, overly emotional. You want to remove that stimulus to hopefully reduce the patient's symptoms, okay? If they stop their medications, they need to get them back on as soon as possible. Oh, the, yeah, the, the, maybe the video is still there about the the, uh, the testing of the, of the voice to detect Parkinson's before the patient has really any symptoms. And these other videos, I can't exactly remember what they are. I think it shows the patient walking that has Parkinson's and something like that. Even more exciting, let's talk about ALS. Um, amyotrophic lateral sclerosis. We'll call this ALS or Lou Gehrig's disease. Um, this is a... Um, progressive disorder that causes a, uh, dysfunction and paralysis of neurological tissue. Remember that when you think about Parkinson's and ALS, that men are more affected than women. It's said that it's rapidly progressive because usually within 10 years, the patient will be diagnosed and they will progress to death. So I would say that that's a rapid progression of the disease. I you know, it's two to five years. It's not bad about that. And it takes a long time to diagnose it, but once they diagnose it, then there, it was like two years after that. Yeah. Because he probably had had it for a long time. Mm -hmm. They only diagnosed it two years before they died. So you have death of the of the, the, the neuro tissue, right? Um, and this is possibly due to the overproduction of glutamate. Remember that glutamate is a neurotransmitter, but glutamate is neurotoxic. So the patient may have an overproduction of glutamate. It's a slow or rapid? Rapid. It's rapidly progressive. Yeah. Um, what was I saying? Glutamate, Glut glutamate is a neurotransmitter that causes neurotoxicity, right? So therefore, that it's theorized that that could be the problem. Um, you have, remember, the ax axon of the neuron, um, and so there's just destruction of the, of the neurons, okay? And the patient eventually has paralysis due to this. But muscle weakness may begin, and then paralysis of the muscles eventually uh, comes back. We've, I've mentioned upper motor neurons and lower motor neurons. Maybe it's on another slide, but upper motor neurons, if they're involved, it's called spasticity. Lower, lower motor neurons are involved with its weakness or paralysis. The brain stem is, is technically still part of those uh, motor neurons. So um, that has to do with speech and things like that in the brain stem. Often the manifestations may begin in just one area of the body. Maybe just one arm is weak. They have focal paralysis. And it's unexplained. The patient hasn't had a stroke. They can't diagnose it. They just have weakness in a part of their body. But eventually the, the overall body will become weak and eventually paralyze. The, the issue here is that the patient um, becomes paralyzed because of destruction of the neural um, uh, tissue. Uh, but the brain tissue itself is not affected. So it's, it's, the, actual, it's the neurons in the, in the lower and upper motor neurons. So the patient's brain is still intact, they can still cognate, but their body is unable to move. Um, so it's, it's really not pleasant. Imagine being trapped inside of your body. Um, it's as if somebody just gave you norcuron all day long, um, and you can't move, but you're trapped inside of it. Not, not a good thing. It's really sad. Eventually, remember that the diaphragm is a muscle controlled by the spinal cord, and the diaphragm will, will eventually become paralyzed. Once that happens, um, the patient, that motor function is not going to return. So when this patient is diagnosed, you want to educate the patient and the family that it's terminal. The patient is not going to get better. It's going to simply progress. And you will talk about end of life issues before the end of life.
like you said, you know, it's, it's, there's no specific test for it. Everything else has to be ruled out first. Um, it's a horrible, horrible yeah, thing. It is. And um, so, and that's often why maybe, you know, like she mentioned, that it's not diagnosed early. Um, it's diagnosed later and then they die even sooner than you would anticipate because you spent that time trying to figure out what is wrong um, because there's no test for it. Electromyelogram detecting the function of the of the neurons is maybe. We can give medications to maybe slow the progression of ALS. Rallutech is an anti-glutamate, so it can decrease the production of glutamate. The theory is that maybe we can decrease the destruction of the neuro tissue. Monitor LFTs. Blood dyscrasias, basically changes on the CBC would be a blood dyscrasia. Changes in electrolytes. You still would want to promote the patient's movement and prevention of contractures, prevention of pain. Um, so speech therapy, occupational therapy, and physical therapy is indicated. The patient will eventually lose the ability to swallow so to feed them, they would need some sort of gastric access, maybe a peg tube, so that we can give them um, nutrition. Again, I've talked about how the disease is irreversible and is progressive, and even if you are on Rallutech, the, the disease is still going to win. So, um, so teach them that, 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 and don't give false hope, simply give them support. So um, teach them that the um, disease, the patient will eventually not breathe, the diaphragm will Diaphragm will become paralyzed, and tell and give them the option, or tell them to think about, or talk about the complications of ventilation. If you come to the point at which you have respiratory dysfunction and you can't breathe, you want to be put on the ventilator. You know, if you put them on a the ventilator, you know, they're going to probably just die from complications of being on the ventilator. So that need that discussion has to happen, and especially if maybe you're the home health nurse, you'll be very involved in this process. Inability to, to, to eat, right, move the mouth to eat, the patient has an increased risk for aspiration. Positioning, um, syringes and rubber tubes can be used to help uh, promote swallow. All right. In kind of this day, I wasn't be amazing. I spelled out the nursing diagnosis for you. Um, but ineffective breathing, um, disuse syndrome, communication, and brain. These are major nursing diagnoses that go along with ALS. I think this link is about a lady who is a nurse. I think she was in the Army, and she um, was diagnosed with ALS, and she uh, still had the only thing that she could do was twitch a part of her face. Somebody set up this system where she, could, she actually wrote a book with twitching her eye. ESPN has a really good piece on an ex Saints football player okay. that got diagnosed with ALS and they've got the shows the machine. He's talking, interviewing with his favorite bands, Pearl Jam, yeah. through the machine and everything like that. So it's kind of neat what they can do to help with communication with these patients. So, um, but the only thing that was preserved was that eye function. Yeah, she wrote a book that was really because it was like the guy talking. We're not going to talk about animals. All right. So let's move on. What types do you have? So that would be on the test, I guess? No. MS is not on the test. What's not on the test? MS. Those are just slides that I've started. So don't look at the MS stuff. Any questions? Anyone that's had a question? Um. How many lectures were on this point? Three. Oh, no, there's two. Oh, you're right. You're right. So, um, yeah, that's probably right. Okay. So, I don't know how many lectures were on this point. There will be more than a row. Because there were some respiratory on the test. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I don't 
There's a pink one there. It's got a butterfly. I like this color. Yay, blue, blue, blue. Turquoise. Yay. <laughs>